If you have your Bibles, I'm going to turn to a quick verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. Amen. I, I want to give a quick shout out to those of you that all the things that you, you did, uh, special things, not just coming to church, but everything ran so smoothly, all the, the music department, everybody does so much. Thank you, Brother Sister Davenport, for the ride to the airport. Uneventful, we didn't almost flip the car hitting a curb. We were safe. <laughs> That's an inside. That was an inside joke right there. Amen. God is, God is good. I want to give a quick shout out, especially to Brother Ezekiel. I, getting ready to fly out of here the other, well, I don't know, week ago or so. I go outside to get in car to run some errands and the battery's dead. Come on now, y'all know. I don't know. There's not necessarily a good time for it to go, but that definitely wasn't even an okay time. And Brother Ezekiel stepped up while I was out of town and made sure Sister Crow's car worked when she got back. So thank you, Brother Ezekiel, for that. Hallelujah. Say amen if you're at 2 Corinthians 6 and 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You can put your Bibles down. and Let's take a moment and Instead of falling in love with Jesus, why don't we just go ahead and tell, tell him how much we love him. We appreciate him right now. Jesus, we love you. We need your help, Lord. I need your help tonight to bring forth your word. So much matters, more, more than we realize. There's no such thing as a gimme service or a, a wasted time in your presence. Help us, Lord, today. Lord, we want to love you. Help us. Show us. Draw us. Help us reach for you to touch you, Lord. We spend so much time asking you to touch us, Lord, but we, we want to touch you tonight, Jesus. We want to bless you, Lord. We want to thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Everybody said amen. 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 Shake your neighbor's hand, and if you can have a good attitude, you can be seated. Praise God. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 11 and 12 states, I returned and saw under the sun. I like that because that's everybody. That the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen it to them all. You choose your life. How many likes that? In America, we like our freedoms because we get to choose. I'm thankful for the right to choose. My right to choose, though, is also a glaring finger pointing at me that I don't always make the best choices. There's a story told by Brother Hernandez that Brother Cole told him. He was driving down a long road back east, and he's driving along, and the Lord impressed upon him to stop and preach. He literally explains the story. is literally being told, stop and preach right now. Stopped his car and looked around, and there wasn't nobody around. There's a only thing of significance was a bridge just ahead of him. And so he stopped the car, got out, and he preached. Brother Hernandez asked, well, how long did you preach, Brother Cole? <sighs> just a few minutes. He said, I got out and preached to the top of my lungs. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And he, he said, I preached for just three or four minutes. 
said, I preached until I felt the release. And unless you're a preacher, that won't make a lot of sense to you. But there's a release that comes when you've delivered what God has laid on your heart. So the Cole says he got in his car and he drove off. You know, he said, I, I've done what I was told to do. Years later, Brother Cole said that he was in a service and he was preaching. The man walked up to him and, and said, Brother Cole, you don't know me. You don't know who I am. But I want to tell you a story. 20 years ago, you remember stopping on the side of the road and getting out of your car and preaching. Well, the protocol was shocked, and he said, yeah, I do. How do you know that? He said, I was a guy that was living under the bridge just ahead. I was a backslidden preacher. God called me back into the ministry and back home back to church. I don't know from the time that Brother Cole stopped to get out and preach that that man got himself back in the church. I, I don't know and that's not really all that important per se because he got back. The issue is, is how many messages are we going to get? Whether you're sitting in a pew or under a bridge, how many messages and opportunities are you really going to get? Now, I can speak for me, I can't speak for you, but I've had a couple. Now, I know y'all been perfect little angels your whole life and never really needed his grace. But I've done a few dumb things in my life and I'm thankful to be here. So I want to speak on just the topic tonight and I'm going to try to teach more than preach because I don't want anything missed. Young people, I'm so thankful you're here tonight. Please listen because if I can reach you, if, if some, somehow you can stay in the church your whole life, then your whole life can be saved. And there's a lot of scars you can be saved from. You, you don't have to go experience that garbage to have a walk with God. So please, just give me a few moments tonight. I want to speak on don't waste his grace. Don't waste his grace. We don't know how much time we have. Of all the songs that have ever been written, the one that has actually been sung the most by the largest number of different artists is Amazing Grace. It's the classic Christian hymn written in 1779 by John Newton, a former slave trader turned preacher. Who knew? You can come from a bad place because of the grace of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Grace is a multifaceted thing, though we may not realize it. That age-old hymn portrays various aspects of grace at work. And it's not just it's not just grace that saves me. It's that grace that also keeps me. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first Believe that that grace enables me through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. How many is thankful for grace? 
if we're not careful, we can develop a one-dimensional view of grace that ignores the real work of grace in our lives. We know that we are saved by grace, but grace is about so much more than just saving my soul. We really need a new, renewed, or fresh understanding of grace. It's, it's not just about God accepting us as we are, but it is a lot more about us allowing God to remake us fruitful for him. Oh, by grace, oh, he saves me, yes. But his grace is bigger than that. He doesn't just save you, he remakes you. I'm reminded of the verse where it talks about in the last days, there's going to be, we've done many wonderful works in your name. Jesus will say, I never knew you. There's more than just accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and then you can go do whatever you want. When you give yourself to him, you belong to him, and now your will should be to please him. That's Bible, folks. That rubs against us a long way. Well, I just want Jesus to save me so I can keep doing what I'm doing. That's like saying, listen, I, 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 listen I'm going to get married. We're going to get married and all that, but I'm still going to go see Jim on the weekends. Oh, Hello? Is that all right? Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how that works. Ephesians 5 and 11. God needs to remake his purposes and have no fellowship. Listen to me. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You, that, that's just, and you're not doing it. It's just next to you in the room. Bible talks about having pleasure in those that do them. Which, listen, this is still talking about grace. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But rather reprove them. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And besides this, giving all diligence. How many knows what diligence is? It's effort. It's 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 doing everything you can to add to your virtue. <laughs> virtue is virtuous. It's holy, it's clean, unpolluted, unsullied. Add to your faith. You say you're a believer, that's faith. Virtue. That's how you live. That's what you watch. That's what you listen to. That's where you go. That becomes who you are. All this holiness stuff. No, I, I, that's just the Pentecostals. No, it ain't. It's the Bible. Pentecostals just happen to be the ones that believe it. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. No, no, no. Let me say it this way. They still preach it. Look how big that church is over. That's okay, but they're not preaching virtue anymore. Just believe in your sake. What do I mean? He's talking about virtue here. Hey, guys, we all want a virtuous woman. Right? He wants a virtuous bride. The church is the what? You want to find out what kind of church he wants? Go read Proverbs 31. Hey, ladies, let me help you with something. Listen, I don't care what that joker says out there. Oh, I like a girl like that. When they all want to settle down. They want a good girl. They don't want no ghetto girl. It's cute for a minute when you talk like that, but they don't, no one wants to come home to that mess. No one wants to come home to a girl that acts more dudish than the dude. Uh-huh. You understand what I'm saying? And to your virtue, knowledge. Knowledge and understanding will help you understand why you live soberly, righteously, 
in this present day. If you're struggling with, with, with standards, if you're struggling, listen, ladies, I don't care if you're home alone with your dad. Girls, there ought to be just something about you you're going to address right. It doesn't matter if you're coming to church or going to the grocery store. There ought to be something about you. I, I am so special. I am made for one man. And when that time comes, that's when there'll be the revealing. But I ain't about to just, hello? If it ain't for sale, it don't need to be on show and display. I'm talking about the church still. And to knowledge, temperance. You can have a lot of friends, but you have to have a, you, you can't always go where they go. Can't always do. And the argument is, well, why can't you do this? Your church don't let you. Oh, no, no, hold, hold, hold up a minute. No, I, I belong to the church that I know preaches the truth. It's not the church, it's, that, it's me. I, I, I'm temperate in all things. I, I just, don't, don't, you, 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 can, you can give the church some credit for the teaching, but understand I, I'm doing the following here because I'm giving myself to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm, I'm holding on to my virtue, and with virtue comes some knowledge, and with knowledge comes temperance. And temperance, patience. Why patience? It's going to wear on you, folks. The Bible talks about the enemy wearing out. This. Don't get wore out with this. Don't be wore out. Don't get tempted out of it. Are you hear what I'm saying? And to patient godliness. Godliness isn't a mistake. It's a choice. I want to live godly, soberly, righteously in this present age. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. You don't have to hang out and do stuff with bad people, but you still be kind with them. You can still be kind. Because you're trying to pull them up to where you're going. Not that you're better. I just choose to do something better. I choose to do something different. Are you hear what I'm saying? I know this is not popular. For if these things be in you. Ah, my church wears, makes me wear skirts and dress like a girl. Well, yeah, funny. You don't think that's an issue? Then why are they so bad trying to get skirts on boys out there? You ever noticed all this whole confusion thing going on? Then girls that want to be guys do everything they do to look like a guy. And these guys that want to be girls do everything to look like a girl, but yet we fight with that in the church. What? Oh, it's quiet in there. What? Y'all backslide, I was gone. Don't, don't get me. I just want to teach. I don't want to. Don't make me preach. Am I still in an apostolic Holy Ghost filled church? God's not the author of confusion. All that confusion out there is man. Try, they're trying to make themselves bigger than God. No more than God. Oh, no, no. We're, we're in this to win this because we have knowledge that we added to our virtue and our chance. For if these things be in you and abound. See, knowing these things ain't enough. They need to abound. They make you that you shall be neither. Are you ready? Barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Grace is not just God's acceptance of you. It is also your surrender to him. Not my ways anymore, but his ways. Uh, see, I'm all in. See, if you don't believe me, just, 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 just go look at people that are groupies. Pretty soon, they, what, do they, what do they call those? They call them tribute bands. Y'all don't know that much about them, man. They got bands that run out trying to look like the original, and they play all their tribute songs because they don't have to do nothing on their own. They start, they call them groupies, so they dress like them and act like them and, and whatever. But we're supposed to act like, dress like, that we emanate him. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, people that don't get this don't know him. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. Someone can come up to me and say, I'm a believer. Now forgive me. If I look at their life and I don't see believer traits, don't get mad if I ask some questions. In fact, Acts 19 some disciples came up to, the, to, a, to a real disciple 
Oh, we're believers. Oh, really? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? That's important. That's important because if you don't get God in you, how can you <laughs> take up your cross and follow? Which leads to being fruitful. This is the aspect of grace that is overlooked today and even they say, oh, you think you do that makes you saved? No, I'm saved. That's why I do that. No, I don't live this way to make me saved. I live this way because I am. Oh, wait, I'm not saying no to you because I'm married. I'm saying no to you because I love my wife. I don't. Do you see the difference? That's why, hey, young people, get this in you. It's going to save you. Because you better believe there's going to be some slick talking. You ain't really got to do that. That, that. That's what the serpent's first words were in the garden. His tricks ain't changed. You have to, do you really got to do that? It's funny that it's all a work of God in religious circles, but in other areas, you'd be called nuts. Only, only the church. Really? I, I have no idea what that is. Okay. Oh, I'm an athlete. Really? Where do you compete? Well, I don't compete. What are you going to say then? Is he an athlete? I'm a mechanic. Oh, let me see your tools. I ain't got no tools. I'm a teacher. Oh, where's your classroom? Line? I'm a singer, but sing me. I don't know any songs. That sounds hilarious to you, right? I'm a disciple of Christ. Well, no, I never taught a Bible study. Never taught a Bible study. No, I don't go to a church. Do you see when you put it side by side? How but yeah, we live in a world today. Ah, this guy's you don't need to do anything. People aren't reading their Bible. And they frustrate the grace of God. In reality, they, they, they frustrate the things of God. Oh, I'm a believer. But your life isn't lived to please him? Grace should, oh, grace, I'm talking about grace, should always result in growth that causes us to be fruitful. Amen? Listen, if grace was just about God saving me, no matter my response to that grace, then it would be impossible for grace to be frustrated. Did you hear me? If grace operated as an extension of God's sovereign power alone and overlooked my faults and failures simply because I placed my faith in the Lord, then it would be impossible for the grace of God to ever be in vain. If faithfulness did not matter, then grace would always... Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Why, well, why, why, why are you teaching Bible study? Why are you going to church? Why are you trying to win a loss? Why are you praying? Why? Because I don't want to frustrate his grace. Why are you living like that? Why are you acting like that? Why do you talk like that? Why has your life changed? We liked it better when you were in the world. We liked it better. But I'm not, I, I, I'm not, look, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't want to frustrate his grace. I like you, but he loves me. I do not frustrate it the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The Greek word translated as to frustrate means to make something ineffective. I don't want to make his grace in me. I don't want him, this time that he's given me. Can you imagine the gentleman under the bridge? Ah, I'm not going to listen this time. I wonder if someone ever would have preached him again. I, I, wonder, I wonder if you get another service after tonight. 
I wonder if you get, you may, you may get 100 more. But what if it takes 101 and you don't make it? Because you're frustrating the grace of God. It's really just something superficial that you put on. It's not really you. It means to render it null and void. Paul isn't just saying, I, I can frustrate God's grace. He's saying, I can reject it completely in my life. I can make God's grace of no effect. Listen, so we don't miss the impact of this. I, I have to point out that Paul is writing to folks who have been saved. These are people that have been baptized in Jesus' name, full of the Holy Ghost. As a matter of fact, he is using himself as the example in the text. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. Can we, can we make that personal? Can we, can we get the Bible off the pages of the book and get them in the heart of our lives and say, wait a minute. When I come in here, it ain't no show because I'm still going to be like this tomorrow. I dress for church tonight, but it'll be just dressed just the same to go to work tomorrow. I come talking churchy in here. Well, when I go to work, I'm going to talk churchy there too. I don't want to frustrate the grace of God. I'm not going to be in the last. Come on, some of y'all. Get out that phone. Look at some of the search history. Pull that up. You wouldn't do that in here. Someone might see. But if you go do it when we don't see, you're still frustrating the grace of God. You're only drinking water in here, but what did you drink over there? I don't want to frustrate the grace of God. When he says it, he says it in the present tense. He's not saying, I did not. That's not what he said. He said, I do not. That means right now. I, I, uh -uh. I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. The only way that sentence has any force is if it was possible for Paul to frustrate the grace of God. And this is overlooked often when it comes to the truth about grace. God loves you just like you are, but God will never leave you the way he finds you. Let me, let me explain. Come on, and there's some of you, you got these huge bleeding hearts to help the homeless. They choose to be homeless, and you choose to go help them, that's great. But you have to understand that that feeling, oh, I can't, I found them, I, I can't leave, let me give them some food. God finds us in sin. He doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to pull us out. Grace doesn't overlook sin. His grace offers forgiveness as a way to escape from sin. Because effective grace will not leave you where it finds you. Grace brings me out of the miry clay. Grace draws me out and sets my feet on the rock to stay. Grace lifts me up. Grace changes my direction. In fact, talking to Ian, Ian has made it quite clear that things have just started turning around for my life since I started going to church. Can I tell you what it is? It's the grace of God, and you're doing things associated with God. Let me tell you. It's nothing wrong with coming to church. We're in a safe place. It's highly doubtful you'd be acting like a jack wagon in the house of God. And if it takes being here every day of the week, you better get your carcass here. If you struggle on a Friday night, you might want to come down to the church to pray. If you have trouble, where do you go on a Saturday night? You might want to come down to the church to pray. I don't want to frustrate the grace of God. The grace of God establishes my way. It equips me for the new life that I'm living. I'm thankful for the grace because it keeps me. But that grace also empowers me to get up and do something different. And, and, and it provides for me. And ultimately, it makes me fruitful in the kingdom of God. You'll find the greater impact God has on you and you allowed to have, the more impact you're going to have in the world in drawing people. You know, we have folks around here who work in all different fields of labor. We got people that work in the medical field and we see them every now and then in their scrubs. 
we got some people who work in the schools, and you can tell young people stay away from them quick, hurry, because they're going to start talking about all the stuff going on in the schools. They give away where they work by their speech. You know, the medical field by their clothes. Uh, you got some people work in the construction industry, hang around, and they, they drive trucks. They come in in work boots, and we see them talking about tool. Why? You can tell why. Because there is a product or fruitfulness of what they're involved in. If you're going to be involved in Christianity, we ought to be able to see the fruit of it. It ought to affect how you talk and what you dress like and where you go and what you do. I got to be careful. I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but I, I, was, I was over listening to some family talking the other day because one of the Young men in the family had gotten a toolbox. And someone was checking out. They were kind of laughing because now he really ain't got no tools. <laughs> and I get it. I get it, but the analogy still works. Because if you're a Christian, we should see some of the tools. We should see some of the clothes. We should hear some of it coming out of your mouth. If someone says they're an athlete, you know, they kind of have some muscles a little bit, might help to prove something. You got a jersey anywhere? No? Yeah? Okay. Is this too simple? Because the last thing I want anybody in my ministry, don't waste his grace, folks. Yeah. Don't waste his grace. It's time for the be some fruitfulness to prove the grace of God that allowed you to, to be here. You can tell who and what you are by what you produce. But understand the power, the power of grace is not automatic. You have to work with it. It won't simply just transform you because it exists. It's not going to happen without your active participation. What 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 did he tell the, the the adulterous woman? She just got dragged out of a house in the middle of business. Drug in front of Jesus, there's a bunch of people standing around on rocks, grown men wanting to stone her. She just got saved from a He didn't say go home. Grace, his grace, his mercy, his word just saved her. Go and sin. No, don't put yourself in the same situation. I might not be there for you. You made it here tonight. Don't take another chance. Don't, 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 don't go do it again. Does that make sense? So we're talking about the grace of God, and you can't leave out the fruitfulness part. And so the Bible contains a couple of parables that illustrates this truth. The first one I'm going to use is found in Isaiah 5, 1 through 4. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved. Touching his vineyard, my well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the most choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. That's the expectation. God has expectation of you. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Mm. You see, it doesn't matter what kind of fruit you do bring. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me, that I have not done in it. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. God said, I, I placed my vineyard on a very fruitful hill, and I, I, I picked a good spot for it. I, in fact, I picked the best spot for it. And, and he said, I, I, I built a fence around it, and I, I protected it to stop it from being stomped on or trampled on or ruined. And I gathered the stones out of it. I worked the soil, and I removed the hand. How many of us know God's been doing some work in your life? And he's done, I many can say, God's been good to me. Can anybody here say, God's been good to me? Ha! 
How many know if God hadn't pulled some strings or done something, it wouldn't be as good as it is right now. So he's, he's worked your soil, he's worked your life and removed the hindrances that might choke out the growth. He planted the choicest vine, the hardiest, most productive, best tasting vines you could find. He didn't stop there. I wanted to protect my vineyard, so then I built a tower to watch over it. He committed his self to the safety of his vineyard. Do you hear me? Standing over it and guarding it. Some of us don't like that. Some of us get upset at the preaching because it points out and you kind of let things slip a little bit because he wants to protect it and preserve it. But last and certainly not least, we see that he finally said, I made a wine press within it. And that's key. You, you have to understand something about being a Christian, a real one, not, 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 not this commercial secularized Christian that, that we got all over the place. If our churches all across America were really the churches of the word and of the spirit, our country wouldn't be in the state that it's in. The point of the vineyard is grapes. The whole reason of all this effort, all this time, and all this expense is because he expects a return on his investment. Y'all jump and shout, he's been good to me. What have, you, what have you given back in proportion to what's been given to you? Because he's done everything possible for his vineyard. He goes above and beyond for his vineyard. Well, hey, parents. You buy all the school supplies. You get them that backpack. That's just, just throw that in there. All the new clothes, that new shoes. They got to have them new shoes. They got to have them shoes. Come on, mom. You spend time on them, disciplining them at home and making sure they eat right so they got the energy for the day. You make sure they get up early and get them to school on time because it takes a lot of effort on your part to get them ready. And at the end of the semester, you go looking for fruit in the form of a report card. <laughs> now, I hope none of you were like me. <laughs> Some of you might. I saw them looks. I hated report card day. Well, I was, oh, let the bus crash. Let's sell. I lost it. <laughs> I don't want the report because I know I wasted the grace. I wasted the time I had to learn. I, I did not bring out for you what you put in to me, Mom, Dad. God has provided everything for his vineyard for you and I. He prepared us to be successful. Because when he comes, he expects a return. He wants to find good grapes in his vineyard. God's been good to you, right? We all said yes. He's been good and then some. Can we say that? I can't. I can't. Maybe he ain't done. He maybe ain't done for you what he's had to do for me. But we'll, we'll, I, I, and I'm fine with that. He's looking for fruitfulness from me. And, I, and I, look, 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 I, I wish I was spiritual. I walked up on a, another level spiritually. But I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes I just simply do because I know it's right with God. I owe God. If you think I like to give all my life and all my time and, and, and teach Bible studies and give my money and do this, all that, you're out of your mind. I like to be go as selfish as everybody else. I like to have a great big old house, a great big old car with a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. In my flesh. But I realize, by God, I don't want to waste his grace. I can go do this, I can go, but Jim, tell you why I don't. I'm not going to waste his grace. I'm not, he didn't give me all what he gave me to turn around and waste it on me. He expects a return from me. And so this time I get myself up and I, I take myself to where I did. I, I go and do this and I, I go, not because it feels good, because it's right. Not because I know I'm going to be accepted, but because it's right and he's worth it. He done pulled me out of the miry clay. Oh, I want to retire and go do this and I want to go do that. And I got this to do. Got to God be whatever. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to waste his grace. I don't want to waste his all oh, my. He looks at me and he knows he's tilled my ground. He's done so. Oh, he's done so much for me. How's it say? I cannot tell it all. 
And it's a sad day that he could put in a little paragraph what I've done for him. He has a right to expect growth. Watch this. Harvest time comes and the vines produce only wild grapes. Now, at face value, it may seem as if the vineyard simply produced subpar grapes, but that isn't the case at all. When the, when the prophet speaks of wild grapes, he's speaking of a product that was described as worthless and stinking. You ever get a bad attitude about church? You get a bad attitude about the things of God? They take up an offering and you... You actually think that, no. Oh, Oh, man, we got to go again. Look, I'm not trying to point no finger, but let's be honest about our spirits. Let's be honest about our attitude. Because we think, man, I checked my box. I was here Sunday and Wednesday. No, you came here because this blesses you. This helps you. This is for you. The only part that's for him was the worship. How'd you do that? The only time it's him was, who was here? Who? Everybody stand up that was here on time for prayer. Man, you glad you did it tonight, huh? You glad? I'm glad to see you. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Everything needs a starting point, sister. You keep doing it. For a long, who knows where you're going to be. But when you make those commitments, you're blessing God back. You're saying you are worth God. God, you're worth it. I can never repay you for what you've done for me. How dare I take the things of God and treat it roughly? How dare I start taking it for granted? I don't want to waste the grace. This might be my last service. How dare, why would I show up late? Why would I blow it off? Why would I think it didn't matter? God, don't let me waste your grace. The sad thing is some of us have been, we, we've been those wild grapes and we poured out that wine and our kids drank it and now they don't care about the church. They were inedible grapes. They were useless. And the, and the Lord, he didn't suffer. He says, judge. This is scary. You don't like that word. Judge between me and the vineyard. Do you realize what just happened there? Here's God, and here's us. Go on with your tight wad self. Go on with you. I don't feel it. I ain't worshiping. I've done my part, man. I've done my ICC trash, but I ain't picking it up. I see work needs to be done. Oh, I've done my part. That's not my job. Oh. Oh, and, and, and the Bible says, and the Lord said, what more could I have done? Some of you, were, you're all in it, what, what God done for you. you want, yeah, 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 done for me. And you want to give him lip service. That was easy to give, folks, because we all did it. But he's like, after all the work, after all the effort, I've been serving God a long time. God's been working your soil that whole time. Wait, you think it was all you? God, I've been in sing almost 40 years. Well, I could turn around and say, okay, God, I've done it. Oh, my God, don't you realize you're you just now getting started after 40 years, pal? I just got the rocks out. Now I'm going to put some seed in it. What, you think you've been that fruitful? What, you've been that fruitful, Sister Crow? How many years now, Corey? Are you done? This is something to think about. How many years, Denise? Living for God. We'll count all of them. He's working on it. There's moving rocks then. That, 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 that. Right? Working the soil a little bit. Thank God, every time I see every one of them up here singing. What, you, you think they're perfect because they're up here? What, you, you think that, that joker, that mows the yard around here is perfect? I don't want to waste his grace. 
I'm going to keep on working. I want to stay involved. I want to get right in the middle of what God is doing because I ain't going to wait his grace. I want to be involved in the nitty gritty of all of it until he comes. I don't want to waste his grace. Prayer time, I'm there. Fasting time, call me up. Bible, I want him. I don't want to waste I never want to get the arrogant attitude because at one day, judge between me and what you produced. What, what's he saying? Was I supposed to be satisfied with those worthless grapes? Can you imagine living for God for 40 years like me and be bitter and turn around and say, out of church, that was me. Thankful for the job. You know, the message here is simple. God is saying to the kingdom of Judah, I have the right to expect good fruit. God has the right to expect good fruit. He said, I've done the hard work and I've prepared the good ground. I've planted the best vines. I've, I've watched over and protected my, how many times has he watched over us? I have given it everything that it needs to be successful. And I got wild grapes. I can't use you because you're bitter. I can't use you because you're upset. I can't use you because every time you turn around, you got something to complain. I can't use you because I wouldn't do it the way pastors do. I can't use you because it's got to be your way. That I can't. Watch what he does. Verses five through seven. And now. Go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And I will break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged. But there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that it may, won't rain upon it. And the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, and behold, oppression for righteousness. But behold a cry. This is what the Lord said I'll do to my vineyard. I'm doing everything for you and all I get is sour grapes. What we got coming up? We got, we got a, a fundraiser we got coming up. We got some cooking thing coming up. You ought to be jumping to help him. You got people lost at your job. You got to be, you got a neighbor to, you ought to be jumping at reaching out. If God can stop a preacher driving down the road to preach to nothing, reach a man up, where, where are you at? What, you done? Oh, I don't want to waste his grace. School, school starting. Don't waste this. Take it to school. Yeah, you're going to fight battles. You're going to get persecuted. Don't waste his grace. Someone's watching. Someone's watching. Someone. I'm going to go to his church. He just don't know it yet. I'm going to follow her and go to her because she don't know it yet. But I'm watching her act different than everybody else. Oh, I don't want to get to that place where God just removes your cans or removes you because you got to make whatever. You treat the things of God roughly. Because he gets so frustrated, he says, I'll tear down the wall, I'll remove the hedge, I'll let it be trodden down, I'll lay it waste, I won't prune it, I won't mulch it, and the briars and thorns will spring up. Bitterness, a root of bitterness. And I'll even command the rains to not rain. You get yourself in a spiritual drought like that. You know what? Why don't we just stand and thank God for his grace right now? God, let me get the downpour. Restore me, help me. Go, God. Don't let me dry up. I'm thankful for the grace. Don't, don't let me dry up. I've had a bad attitude. I want to be put back in. I want to be involved. Get me back in there, God. I've had a wrong attitude. I don't want to be poisonous, great. I don't want to be where God rain on me. Rain on me. Rain on me. I don't want to waste your grace.